Hello again everyone and welcome back to the underground. So today we're going to be taking a look at some of the more technical aspects, uh, the adapters and settings and other things you might need if you want to turn an old school uh, Soviet trench periscope like this one into a more modern tool that you can use in today's world. So let's get right to it. We recently put out a video on uh, the trench periscope, uh, its history and some of the uses for it in warfare and things like that, particularly in urbanized warfare. And uh, this is well, this is a unique tool that um, we here haven't really seen a whole lot of uh, content on. Like, not a lot of people are talking about these. And uh, even though that these are a very very useful tool, uh, in, even in the modern world, especially in the modern world with with today's modern uh, optics and things like that. So, uh, if you want, you can check out the video we already did on the history of this and uh, some of the things to consider when trying to find one for yourself, uh, because these are getting kind of hard to find these days. But uh, in that video, we had a few specific setups uh, that we use to use these kinds of periscopes in a modern world for things like observation, uh, setting up urbanized observation posts, uh, things like that. All right, so before we get into talking about the actual periscope itself and some of the things that we can put on this device, we're going to talk about how to carry it first. So obviously this is a, just a essentially just a piece of steel pipe, right, with some mirrors and prisms in it. Um, and it comes normally, if you were to buy these online, they normally come in the classic old school Soviet style case, which is very distinctive. Now, what I do uh, with mine and uh, some of the other staff here as well, uh, you can get creative and make your own case. So that's exactly what I did. I made uh, several of these cases. This is uh, an earlier prototype uh, that I made out of a camouflage material, but... Uh, if you're going to be doing this and using this in kind of an urban environment, this piece of steel pipe is is not it's not it's just a little bit too long to fit in a normal standard uh, assault pack or, or some kind of day pack if that's what you're going for. Um, so it's not going to fit inside. So you're going to have to carry it usually strapped to the outside or something like that. And this looks kind of suspicious when it's just the you know the bare tube here uh, strapped to the outside of a pack. It's kind of distinctive. If nothing else, it's a visual marker. Um, so what uh, what tends to work out pretty well is making your own case. Uh, this one, if you'll notice, is a lot different than the standard uh, Soviet-style ones. Uh, the periscope goes in here, and here is an additional pocket uh, that I sewed on this one just to kind of see if it would work. Um, again, I would advise not making this out of a camouflage material. I just did this because I was, you know, had some extra materials. As you can see, all the buckles are different colors, all the threads a different color. Um, so, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, right? Try to, uh, try to make use of all the other materials that we might not be using. And in this case, uh, this is what this case was made out of. Now, before we move on to the periscope, let's talk about what's in the case. So, in this little uh, zippered box here, we have some of our adapters, uh, which we'll get out and we'll talk about here in a second. Um, let's see here, adapters and extensions and things like that. Uh, I got a little multi-tool down in there just because you never really know. Um, but also I've got some of these, uh, these little tube uh, camouflage devices. So uh, you can make these out of any kind of fabric. I was just kind of goofing around and made one of these and thought, hey, this actually works out quite well. So I've got these different um, camouflage tubes that can just slip right over the edge, right over the end of the periscope itself. And as you can see here, it's still kind of jagged with a little bit of mesh there and it kind of dis disguises that main color so if you're trying to fit into a more specific area or something like that where uh, this this tube shape might stand out this is something that works out very very well um, and you can kind of use some mesh here at the tip to disguise the uh, uh, the reflect the reflectivity of the uh, periscope uh, lens there if you're so inclined that, that tends to work out pretty well uh, most of the time, when you get these periscopes, they're going to come in so many different colors, it's ridiculous. Um, because these were repainted and reused post-war. Most of them were made post-war, and uh, they've been painted about a million times. Uh, so this one, it, every single periscope that we have here is a different color. Like, there's no standardization when it comes to this kind of stuff. They're all a sort of olive green um, or even like an old school khaki OD green sometimes. So depending on which color one you've got in your environment, you might find it to be a little easier to use some scrap fabric. Again, taking advantage of, of any materials you might have to make some of these uh, slip covers uh, for your periscope. So I thought that was kind of an interesting thing that not very many people seem to be doing. 
Um, and I thought that was kind of handy uh, for certain environments, particularly ones where uh, the tube color might not match your environment. So, all right, so moving the case out of the way here for a second, uh, we can talk about some of the other stuff we've got here. Uh, now, on the actual periscope itself, you might notice uh, an adapter right here, or it's at least it's functioning as an adapter. We'll get to that in just a second. First, I wanted to talk about the custom adapter that I had to make uh, to make this work. So this, this little adapter here, allows the periscope to function with, if I can find it, here it is, a tripod. Now this is very handy. So uh, having a small generic uh, tripod, I'm not even really sure who this company is, but uh, having, a, having a very small uh, generic tripod is very helpful for, um, well, really any surveillance in general if you're using some kind of optic, but particularly the periscope. Um, this thing is pretty heavy. Uh, it's, it's several pounds. And uh, standing like this for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours a day gets a little bit fatiguing. So if you can use a tripod to help you hold it, um, or if you're trying to use optics with this, you're going to need a tripod hands down. Uh, this is a great way to do it. So let me show you how that works because it's it, it kind of took us a while to figure this out. And uh, one of our other staff members here kind of figured out this configuration and uh, I did my best to poorly recreate it uh, on mine. So uh, this is the adapter that we can use. Now this is kind of a custom adapter. This is really just a, a, uh, a, a bicycle GoPro mount uh, that use, is used for uh, mounting a GoPro to a uh, bicycle handlebars. Now on mine, uh, the actual GoPro part here uh, broke off. So this is a repair. So. Uh, I'm not really sure where you can get this anymore, but I can tell you that this part right here, these little ears here, these are a custom part uh, that can go on the uh, GoPro Hero 8. I think this is the 8, right? Yeah. So you can actually replace the uh, little ears here on the bottom of the 8, and I think probably the 9 and 10 or whatever number GoPro is on now. You can replace this part. You can, I don't know, maybe you can see it or not. Uh, you can unscrew this, take these little ears off, and you can replace it with this. Now this allows you to screw the GoPro into a tripod, like a normal standard tripod, uh, like like this tripod head here, this normal quarter inch screw, I think this is what it is. Uh, so using that replacement part for the GoPro 8, what you can do is, is quite uh, quite interesting. You can disassemble this mount fully here, take the screw out to better show. Take this rubber piece off on the inside, and as you can see there, you can screw right through to the other side there uh, into the back side of this little dog-eared mount. Now, what this will do will allow you to now use this periscope with any GoPro mount you might have. And if you use GoPros, you know that um, uh, the mounts for GoPros are basically a, a, an infinite money pit, uh, meaning that you can buy literally dozens of these things to mount your GoPro in different spots and they're all kind of expensive. Um, so being able to reuse them and uh, take advantage of uh, existing hardware, it lightens your load, it reduces your cost, and it's a pretty smart thing to do, at least in my opinion. So this device right here can help us attach the uh, periscope to a tripod. So let's go ahead and walk through that right now. And now you have these little ears which can fold out and can interface with the tripod. So what you need to do is you can get yourself one of these standard GoPro tripod mounts. This is just a metal one. And we can start attaching this to the tripod. I know this already gets a little crazy with the adapters, but uh, once you've kind of dialed in your system and you've got all these little bits and bobs of hardware, uh, most, of the, most of this stuff I just had lying around. Um, really, the effort comes in with research and development and trying to figure out what works, uh, which hopefully we can help with <laughs> by showing you at least what we're doing. So, we've got that in there on your tripod. Now you can take the ears of this little thing here and the interfaces right in there. We could take our pin. Sometimes it's a little challenging to get the uh, screw here done, but. Once we can get it in there, we can get it screwed shut. Um, I prefer the metal 
options for a lot of this GoPro stuff because even though it's a little bit the to tolerances are a little bit tighter, it is a little bit easier uh, in the long run. Um, so there we go. Now we've got the uh, periscope all attached to the tripod, and the cool part about it is you can you can do all kinds of stuff. Like you can if you've got a little ball joint, you can change the angle um, at which this is at. So that now you're looking sideways out a window. Um, you might have to do a little bit of tightening and things like that on some of these parts, but hey, this works out quite well, and it's a good little good little base uh, to have everything situated on. So now you've got a periscope oriented vertically. Uh, you can do it either way you want. Um, I've had great success with actually reversing this and having the periscope go down through like subflooring or something like that uh, into a room below, and that works out quite well uh, also. So uh, there we go on the actual tripod. Let's move into some of the adapters themselves. All right, so getting into the actual periscope itself, uh, this device here on the bottom is a 1.5 inch scope ring uh, with a Picatinny mount here on the bottom. Now, 1.5 inch scope rings are kind of non-standard, so uh, you'll find that they tend to be kind of expensive, but the good part about this particular setup here is that we're not exactly going for precision marksmanship or anything like that, so you can actually use airsoft equipment, and I'm pretty sure this is just like a, a, a normal scope ring for like an airsoft gun or a BB gun or something like that, so uh, that works out quite well because they're a little bit more common for whatever reason. These little no-name branded uh, Chinese-made um, pieces of aluminum here that just kind of screw in and function like that. Now, what we can do with this is kind of interesting. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about the adapter itself. So this is a homemade adapter. Uh, it might look a little janky, but it's really it's really quite simple. All it is is a 5-inch uh a uh, piece of angle steel here, really just meant for shelving board and things like that, uh, which uh, I've got some uh, pick, uh, pick rail here on the top and on the side. Now what this allows you to do is attach this right here. Usually I use the, the second, uh, second notch. And as you can see there, hopefully that kind of illustrates the concept here. Now you've got a base to mount optics behind the optic. Now, obviously, this is not perfect. Uh, obviously, it would be preferred to have some kind of non-air-gapped way of looking through this optic using another optic, but it does work quite well. Um, we do this kind of thing all the time, um, sort of, in theory at least, with things like flip-up uh, magnifiers, which work quite well with this as well. So this is a four times uh, magnifier normally, and if we can throw on another magnifier, boom, now we've got some flip up capability uh, to, to greatly increase our magnification. Now, sometimes I've noticed that, that obviously you're going to get a little bit of wobble, but I myself have found that this works out quite well. Um, you're able to focus you, by having that small air gap right there. You're able to focus uh, the periscope to, to get it just right, and you're also able to adjust the, the diopter here to to get your focus right, just so that it, it's as clear as you could possibly make it. So that's pretty cool. Um, very interesting use if you have um, one of these uh, flip-up uh, magnifiers, or if that's something you use, you can uh, you know, take take one off of a primary weapon or something like that, and then there you go. You've now greatly increased your magnification. Again, once you start doing things like stacking glass in front of glass, you're going to deal with a couple of different things. like. Uh, first of all, you're going to deal with wobble and shake, so that's why you have a, a, a good, decent tripod to mount all of this on so that you're not wobbling all over the place, right? Uh, and then also the biggest, the biggest factor is light transmission. Once you start stacking more and more glass that light has to go through, this light to get to, to, to your eyeball has already got to go through, what, like three feet of glass? So adding in uh, even more glass on top of that is not exactly good for low light conditions. So you might find that, that the, using a flip-up optic in low light conditions does not work very well. One of the most useful and one of my personal favorite ways to use a, a periscope in a modern world with modern tech is to use a PVS-14 uh, in conjunction with these periscopes. So uh, you can, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat with this and you can use a lot of different kinds of night vision devices. My favorite is the old school PVS-14. Um, you can get parts like this. Uh, you, can, you can get parts kits and just build these yourself. Uh, they're not that hard to do. Um, or you can buy them from a retailer. Whatever you want to do is up to you. We have a lot of other videos talking about night vision and things like that. But uh, really, I just like the standard old school PVS-14 um, with, of course, a very, very high spec uh, tube in there. So. Uh, you can use any kind of tube you want. Uh, I've even used uh, a periscope with, with very poor 
uh, will pour comparatively like Gen 2 style tubes and it works quite well. Um, I will say that if you're trying to use this periscope at night, this is mandatory. Like you have to have this because <laughs> think about it, you've got uh, almost two feet of glass there that this uh, this periscope uh, that light has to come through. So it's you really do need this because you cannot use these at night, uh, not even a little bit, unless you're looking at a very bright light source. But even then, good luck finding it with your four times magnification. So let me show you how I normally set up this PVS-14 to work with this. So using our handy-dandy uh, L bracket here that's very stable, uh, what we can do is use one of these adapters. Now this is a uh, PVS-14 Picatinny rail adapter. Um, the U.S. government made a lot of these uh, for the Gulf War, and um, most of them are on eBay, <laughs> so you can get these for pretty cheap. Uh, and all they do is, uh, since these are kind of out of vogue in the tactical community, uh, you can find they're really easy to find still. Uh, you just screw this into the bottom here, and now your PVS-14 can fit on a pick rail and it's just at the right height if I can unscrew this a little bit to get this bad boy to align with the focus ring and there we go so now we can have a PVS 14 attached to our periscope now so obviously this is a little bit cluttered um, we've tried experimenting with ways uh, one of our other riders here is actually experimenting on a way to make this look a little bit less cluttered and be have a little bit uh, more functionality here, but for me this works out really well. Um, all the parts fit together, they work, uh, it just it just works, right? So we've got enough adjustment, there's adjusters everywhere for this, so you can get that perfect image uh, through the tube and get the right focus level, even in the worst, most less than ideal situations, because really if we're using a periscope in the first place, we're using it because of a few reasons. One, because we don't want to get shot. Um, but in a modern civilian world, that might not be so much of a concern for observation needs, right? So if we're trying to observe something, chances are if we're using a periscope to observe something, then that means that it, you're going to be in a less than ideal position. You're not going to have that perfect view, right? You're not going to have that perfect angle with which to see uh, your, your target, right? So having this kind of uh, flexibility and adjustability even though it looks cluttered and doesn't really make for a super great, you know, Instagram selfie, right? This works out quite well. And one of the ways that you can expand this is what some some of the more astute observers might have noticed is this device here on the end of the PVS-14. So normally when you get your PVS-14, it's going to come without this adapter, right? So this is an adapter that will allow you to screw into the, the rear eye. Really, it's for filters, uh, filters holder thing there. And this will allow you to mount a GoPro or really any camera. So uh, what I have here is just a standard uh, GoPro Hero 8. Let's see if I can get this off without breaking it. So standard uh, GoPro here. And the this particular generation of GoPros uh, it has these aftermarket um, snap-on lens filters, right? To, to basically allow the GoPro to use normal standard filters. And this works out quite well because what I have here is I have two stacked. Uh, for one, I don't know if you can see this or not. Uh, my focus is not great on this particular camera, but I have two uh, filters that are screwed onto this. Both of them are 52 millimeter because that's what this little GoPro attachment is. So I have 52 millimeter circular polarizing lens. Uh, now this particular circular polarizing lens is kind of a generic knockoff um, because I'm not using it for polarizing. I'm using it because it's circular. Uh, I haven't found a good way to find a good 52 millimeter clear circular lens that will allow me to uh, put an adapter on this because uh, back when the U.S. made a bunch of these adapters during the Cold War, uh, or, or actually I think technically the Gulf War is when we made most of these, this particular adapter is a PVS-14 to 46 millimeter adapter. Most filters on cameras are uh, going to be 52 millimeters, so that requires an adapter. This is a 52 millimeter to 46 millimeter uh, adapter, and that allow and using the circular polarizer. If this isn't complex enough, I can then grab that and screw it in without moving the camera. Um, that's very important uh, because you never really want to be in a position where you are kind of stuck and your camera can't move, right? So um, this is a great way to have a GoPro available 
and be able to capture what you're seeing through this. And also, since GoPros uh, have Wi-Fi capability, guess what? Now you have a wireless 4K night vision periscope setup. And again, very specific use. Um, you might not be able to use this for everything. You're obviously not going to be able to to use this for some things. And I don't, and I highly doubt that everybody's going to rush out and go uh, start carrying around periscopes every day. So uh, this is for specific roles and for specific uses. But let's just say that you didn't want to use your night vision device in conjunction with your periscope, but you still wanted to use your periscope at night, right? Because if you're going to buy an, a, a now expensive uh, Soviet periscope uh, and you're not going to be able to use it at night, that seems kind of like a waste, right? So that's why you know having a night vision device to use this 24-7 is very handy. But not everybody out there can afford to buy uh, night vision just for a periscope, right? Uh, a lot of times people only get the one or they get uh, two of these and run a dual tube setup. Um, but really, uh, if you can't afford to use one of these or like right now, uh, we're having a lot of issues in the, and we're seeing a lot of issues in the night vision world when it comes to uh, tube availability. Uh, so right now there's a lot of crazy stuff going on and you might find that uh, right now is not a good time to try to find a good Gen 3 uh, image tube. Uh, really, only you're going to get is the is the seconds from the government contracts. Uh, the ones that weren't good enough for the government, they're uh, passing off to the civilian market. That's really all you can find right now. So, again, if you're having a hard time finding a PBS 14 or a good image intensifier tube for for a significant investment like a PBS 14, what you could do is something a little bit cheaper. Um, so you could use a Psyonix Aurora action camera. Um, these have a lot of uh, a lot of praise and a lot of stigma uh, with them in the tactical world. Um, as many of you probably noticed, if you have done any research at all on the Psyonix Aurora cameras, um, there's a lot of stuff about them, a lot of pros, a lot of cons. Um, I can tell you right now that we're working on some some projects with this, and uh, which is why it's in its non-standard configuration. So sorry to tease everybody um, about something that we haven't actually released yet. Uh, but soon, <laughs> soon. Um, but anyway, the Sionix Aurora, you can buy a Picatinny rail adapter for it, and it can just, boom, sit right there on the periscope, and it works extremely well in this particular very specific role. Um, obviously, trench periscopes like this one are not for everyone or for every situation. It's a tool, and it has its use uh, for certain things and not for others. So uh, if you have a need for this, if you have a need for observing things uh, in a non-permissive, non-standard environment, then this could be a great tool for you, especially for things like static observation posts, which are something that we do a lot. Um, these are very useful for that kind of thing. Um, and it, it's really disappointing that the modern versions of this tool um, are just not up to par. They just don't make them like they used to, and these really are the best that you can buy. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we have to literally go back to the Soviet Union uh, to, to find one of these. We have to go back to the earliest days of the Cold War, uh, immediately post-World War II, to find a tool that is useful in the modern era, but that's just the way it is. So hopefully one day a company out there will take this idea and copy it because uh, that would just be great to have a modern version um, that's that's made almost exactly the same way as this one, uh, just with modern tools, modern optics, uh, modern glass, and things like that. Because if this thing breaks, uh, which it's not likely to, like this is a seriously durable piece of equipment. Um, but if it does break, I have to repair it myself. Like we have to repair these things in house here, and uh, we're just gonna have to figure it out, right? So. Um, they don't make parts for these anymore, obviously, and uh, it's kind of unfortunate that uh, in, in the sort of tactical world, I hesitate to call it that, but in the, ta in the tactical world, we have to rely on a piece of hardware that stopped being manufactured, what, 60 years ago, 50 years ago? Um, so it's unfortunate, but you can clearly see these being used around the world even to this day. Um, by very interesting people. So, yeah, I know, it's kind of a, an obscure uh, piece of gear to uh, to talk about so much, and it's kind of weird to uh, dedicate so much time to it, but I think these are interesting. Um, and not only is it something that's interesting, uh, we've gotten a lot of use out of these. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to talk a lot more about that usage 
uh, coming up pretty soon and some of the ways that you can actually implement this not just the adapters and things but the 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 other kinds of ways you can uh, use this tool uh, for your observation needs so thank you again everyone for your support and thanks for sticking around on this one um, and we will definitely see you next time and as always fight in the shade